Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Ro, and I'm an alcoholic. Through the grace of God and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink of alcohol since August the 21st, 1975. And for this, I'm grateful. I, I've been crying like a baby all morning long. I want to tell you, I, I, I'm just full uh, with, with a lot of love in my heart. And I've been looking forward to this for a long time, since since December of this year. And uh I've gave this talk probably about 50 times, and, and <laughs> each time I give it, it seems like it got a little bit better to me. <laughs> but that was that pride and ego that was getting in there, and, and, and I, I really, truly hope that I, I can share with you from my heart uh, of what I have experienced in my life in the, la- in the, in the last 15 years, in my expectation of what's in store for me in the future. Because I, I've read the big book, and I've studied it, and I've listened to what it's got to say. And in the 12 and 12, it talks about us in there, in the 12th step of, of the book, that they want for us to live joyous and happy and free and have emotional sobriety. And, and that's what I've been trying to obtain since I came in this program the second time. And through a God of my understanding and staying close with the people here and in the fellowship, I have no fear uh, of what the future has in store for me. Of uh, Going back and looking at the people that have went before me and the people that are here today, and I'm in good company, and, and I like that, and, and I'm excited about my sobriety. And, and I have been ever since I, I came into this program I was a little confused, uh, uh, and I have been that way quite often. And, and the thing about it today, I know I'm not wrapped too tight, and it just doesn't bother me. <laughs> you know, it used to, but it, but it doesn't today. Uh, but my wife told me that things would be a lot better when I got sober, and, and I didn't understand that, and I know she lied to me because I wasn't used to being responsible, and, and that's created a problem in my life and, uh, of being responsible. But I grew up in the west end part of Louisville, 18th and Jefferson, and uh, I was raised in an alcoholic family. My mother's still living. Uh, she's 72 years old, and she's not drinking today. We have a pretty good relationship. But my life as a young boy of grades, I guess, ages 1 through 10, uh, was just a lot of turmoil in my life. And my mother had remarried. My father left me and my family, my real father, when I was a year old during the Second World War. And uh, I've never seen my real father. He, he left and never came back, never once that I know of tried to ever get in touch with us. And... I carried a lot of resentments about this and a lot of hurt, and and I didn't know how to handle it when I was in school, when you just put down on the paper, Father Unknown. And, and through the grace of God and a lot of people in this program, some four years ago, uh, I located my father. And, and my father died in 1974 in Deer Park, Texas, an alcoholic death, and, and he's buried in a VA cemetery in, in Houston, Texas. And when I'm ready and God nudges me a little bit more, I'm going to go down there and, and, and see his grave. But the hole's been plugged up inside of me, and I don't have no anger and resentment towards this person because of my alcoholism, because I did the same thing to my family as he had done to us. And I realized that when I was separated from my wife and my three daughters, that when I would think about them and that I wanted to go home and see them, I know that I would have to leave. And it was painful, and the emotions was there. And so I choose not to go back because I couldn't handle it. It, it hurt less if I didn't go. 
And I know this is where my father was at and, and that he loved me. And, and, and I'm okay with that today. But as a little boy, I didn't understand that. And my mother didn't talk to me about it that I remember. And I was running the streets when I was five or six years old. And I remember my first day at kindergarten. And I didn't want to be there. And I bit the teacher on the hand and I ran home. <laughs> and I hid underneath the bed. And my grandfather came and got me. And and my grandfather... George reminds me of my grandfather, and he was kind and gentle, and he loved me unconditionally. And he took me back to that school, and so for the next nine years, that's how my life went, just like it was his first day of kindergarten. I didn't want to be there, and they didn't want me to be there, but they had to keep me. And they placed me in an ungraded class, and I was separated from the main body of school, and I didn't learn very much. Uh, I can sum up my teenage years uh, is was that I was a juvenile delinquent before I was a juvenile. And, and, and I was out to get them. I was a good worker as a young boy. Uh, I hustled bottles and, and scrap iron and, and, and I hauled the groceries home for people. And, and I, I become aware of what money was. And I thought that if you had money that you could find all the happiness you want and, and, and the things that you could buy. And that stayed with me for a lot of years, even on in into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I, I was out on them streets and I was a shoeshine boy. And, and I used to go in them taverns when I was six, seven years old. And, and I'd shine these shoes and... and I was a good con back then. I, I, I had a, 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 that I could take advantage of people by being honest, half honest. I never told the truth in my life. I, I told li little bits of it, you know, but I, I'd get one of these drunks in them taverns. I only charged a nickel to shine their shoes, and everybody else charging a quarter and a half a dollar. But I know they'd feel sorry for me because I'd just look up at them and I'd say, no, sir, I only charge a nickel. You know, <laughs> and I always got a big tip, you know, but I, I, I was good at what I did. I excelled in bad conduct. I, <laughs> I loved the attention that I got when, when I was in school. I, I, I didn't get it because I was smart. I wasn't capable at that time of learning. Uh, but since I've been in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I've realized, like Sheila said, that I've got potential. And, I, and I've tried to grow and reach that potential. And I've went back to school and I've got a GED diploma. And I still can't say Sheila's name right. And I've been brought that up a couple times this weekend. They, they would, would you say her name one more time for me? <laughs> so what I had to do when I was 18 years old, stationed down Fort Gordon, Georgia, I had her name tattooed on my arm so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> but... um School was just bad news for me. I, I just uh, didn't want to be there, and uh, I got in a lot of trouble there, and, and I made straight D's and F's all the way through uh, grade school and junior high school. And I was asked to leave when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was in study hall, and, and me and this girl had one of these note-passing relationships and, and, you know, what we're going to do when we get out of school and all of this kind of stuff. And, and it, it was just the way it was. And um, she got mad at me, and it was sixth grade, uh, the last grade uh, um, of school. And when I walked out of that auditorium, she came up and back to me and kicked me. And when she did, I just turned around and hit her in the mouth and knocked her down and went on home. And that's just the way it was. If you hit me, I'm going to hit you back, you know. And when I came back, they asked me to leave that Monday, and I did. And by this time, I was had moved, and we lived across the street from Boone's Park, and it was just one square block, and I fell in love with this place. I had lived over there for when I was 14 years old. And there was the pavilion there, and there was the older guys and, and us younger guys, and they was my idols. Uh, and there was one individual named Earl, 
that he had spent 15 years in the Eddyville Penitentiary. And he did hard time because him and another guy robbed a cab driver. And the other guy got away and Earl wouldn't tell on him. And so as a result, he pulled a full 15 years in the penitentiary in Eddyville. And I looked up to this guy. And I wanted to be like him. And my goal as a 16-year-old was that I wanted to go to penitentiary. <laughs> but that's just the way it was, you know. That you respected them guys, and, and if you could whip me, then you got my respect. If I whipped you, then you respect me, or I whipped you again. You know, that's just the bottom line. And I don't know when I started drinking, but it, it was probably around 14 or 15 years old, and I got in trouble from the word go, because when I drank alcohol, I got diarrhea of the mouth. And I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And just like Dick said, if there was policemen around, they normally let whoever they was going to lock up go and lock me up. And so I've been locked up probably about 30 or 40 times uh, for disorderly conduct and being drunk. And I didn't get caught for a lot of other things that I did. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, the thing that I learned about my goal of wanting to go to penitentiary was that I didn't like to do the time. I just wanted to kind of breeze in and breeze out, you know. Uh, I, I've been to the penitentiary uh, probably three or four times, and I remember the first time that I went. Uh, I was probably about five years sober, and a guy asked me to speak, and I went in in a Cadillac, and then he gave an AA talk, and I got the hell out of there. <laughs> and that's the only way I want to go is in a Cadillac and leave out of there. But at 16 years old, I'm hanging around over at the park, and, and, and I've got a job. I'm a roofer and a gutterer, and, and, and I was a good worker, and I didn't mind working, and I worked for my grandfather. I was making a dollar an hour, and, and, and I had a lot of business sense up here, you know. I, I know that he wasn't charging enough money to uh, the people he was doing work for, and, and uh, he told me, he said, Little Roe, he said, you can only charge a person by how much they've got. You know, if they don't have any more money, you can't charge them no more than that. And I got mad and quit him, and, and he only lived a block away from me. And, and I'd walk down there, and my grandmother would fix my breakfast, and, and we'd come home for lunch, and, and, and he provided the transportation, and I'd make $40 a week. And I didn't like that, and I quit, and I went to work for a roofing company for the same dollar an hour. Had to buy my own breakfast. I had to have my own transportation. And I worked my butt off. <laughs> but I tell you, I learned how to drink with them guys. And, and we used to go around all the taverns uh, in, in our area. And, and after about a week, I got tired of drinking them Cokes. And so when they said it was my time to buy, I just went up to the bar and said, give me three glasses of False City. It was 15 cents a glass. And, and as a result of that, at 16, I could drink in most any tavern bar that, that I went to. And uh, so I was big shot over Boone's Park. I could go get the gas, and we could go, and I could buy it. And, and we just, it was just part of our life. And I met Sheila. She had lived on the corner there at 19th and around about a half a block from me. And she had lived there most of her life. And, and, and I didn't recognize, I didn't know her. But one day she come walking through there. And she was a nice looking girl and still is. And, uh, and I, I got excited when I saw her, you know. I, I just really did. And I'm listening to what these guys at the wall, the pavilion were telling me. He said, you know, if you ever take out a girl, this is what you need to do. And my stepfather said, don't waste your money on them. Just take one of them back in the alley, you know. And so that's all I know. And it sounded pretty good to me. And uh, I, I was afraid to ask her out, though. I, it just scared me to death. Fear has been a big part of me ever since I can remember. I was afraid of the dark. I slept in my, with my head under the cover for 33 years until I came in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I got her brother about halfway drunk and sent him over there to ask her out. And she sent word back that if I wouldn't drink, she would go out with me. And that was a big decision because the alcohol did something for me that nothing else had ever did. It took away that fear. It took away that doubt. 
And it made, it allowed me to do things that I enjoyed to do. It got me the attention that I was searching for. And, and I didn't want to give up the alcohol. I, I was a beer drinker and beer drinker basically all of my drinking career. So I sent word back that I wouldn't drink and, and she went out with me. But the thing about this fear that I had, I couldn't talk to these guys about it and, and because you have to understand of what I look like at 16 years old. And, and I should not have had any fear whatsoever because I'm 16 years old and, and I got hair that's combed back and I got ducktails in the back and I had a spit curl coming right down my forehead and I had a black leather jacket and my paints were pegged and I was cool, you know. <laughs> And, and I wasn't supposed to have any of that fear. And I had a 1950 Plymouth in, in, in a case of Fall City beer. And so what I did, I ended up hiding my beer. And I went out with Sheila expecting to do all the things that them guys said that I should do. And as a result, uh, it didn't happen, you know. But I, and, and she just led me on, you know, for, for the next couple of years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We got married when I was, me and her was 18 years old. Um, I, I honestly, to this day, I do not ever remember asking her to marry her. And, and if I had listened to my mother, I wouldn't have, you know, because she said, bro, you really need to think about that, you know. I don't think she's the girl for you or whatever. But Sheila said that I asked her. And, and I believe her now because she works a good al program today, and she's honest. <laughs> but uh, there was a song we was listening to recently, and I don't know if I really remember, but the song said something about uh, put your hand in the hand of the one or something, and, and I was saying that to Sheila, and she was telling me about that her mother told her that the song that she was aware of that was that, she ought to shop around. <laughs> but we both ended up with each other, and, and uh, our two years of going together was just an alcoholic relationship. I, I was alcoholic at, at 16 years old, and, and I reacted to her actions. And, and I didn't know how to act any other way than with anger and a lot of hostility. And I always wanted to hurt her or hurt somebody even myself, and this went on for a lot of years. And I remember standing out when she used to break up with me, and I would stand out underneath that street light, and I would look up at the window, and I'm 16 or 17 years old, and I had this knot on the inside of me about the size of a baseball or a softball, and I was in a lot of pain, and I didn't know what emotional pain was. I just know that I was hurting. And I used to think the only way I ever going to get rid of this is just to kill her, you know, because I thought it was love. And I'd walk across the street and just run my hands and my fist up against a brick wall and the blood would come. And I was just so angry. And then the next day or two, the uh, other part of me would come out and I would get with her and I would beg her and I would plead with her and I would cry and ask her to take me back. And then she would take me back, and then a week or two or days later, the thought would enter my mind that she's controlling my life, and she's just got a hold of me, and I would become angry, and I would start drinking again, and I would react the same way, and this is how our life went. We got married when I was, we was 18, and I don't remember my wedding night. I remember being at the wedding. I remember being at the reception, and, and, and I was the number one guy. My my, my buddies were there, and and, and uh, I got drunk and went in the blackout. Wrecked a car that weekend, and uh, some probably four or five years in the AA and Al-Anon program, uh, after a meeting, my wife talked to me and, and shared with me our experience on our wedding night, and it wasn't a very pleasant one for her. And I don't remember it. But the thing that I'm very much aware of, that alcoholism is a family disease, and by me being willing to listen and to what my wife has to say, 
and share with me and be going to al I'm a member of al that I have a lot of compassion for the non-alcoholic because I could go into the blackouts and I don't remember it, but they live with it. And, and so today, I've got a lot of compassion for the non-alcoholic. And I always like to throw out a little thing is that, you know, my wife stayed with me a lot of years and, and she stayed with me through a lot of stuff. And, and when I got sober, I asked myself a question, you know, if I accept the fact that this is a disease, then how long am I going to allow them, my family, to find the program as I have? And I see a lot of it in AA where the alcoholic gets sober and they put a time limit on how much time they're going to give the non-alcoholic to get, to get well. And I don't have any time limit on it, and I'm glad that I don't. And as a result of that and the commitment that I made, me and my wife are still together today. In December the 30th of this year, me and Sheila will be married 29 years, and I think that's just great. Uh, you know, we've got 13, 14 years as an alcoholic marriage, and the only purpose that I can see of that other than our kids is that it tells me in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that we will be able to share with others our experience of what it was like. And then she only gets a lot of opportunities to share with families and couples that uh, of what we went through. And as a result of our experience and our growth, I believe we've had a hand in keeping some families together. Because they say, boy, if y'all did all of that and y'all together today, then I think we might be able to make it. And um, But, you know, I couldn't handle responsibilities. And, and when the responsibilities started coming my way, I just turned to drinking that much more. And as Sheila had said, we, we took a geographical cure and moved out to Oldham County. I was a teamster. I was a truck driver. And I worked down in Rubbertown. And I drank at 19th and Griffin at Shamrock Cafe. And the guys were down there. And these were guys that I went to grade school with in junior high school. And we played football and softball over at Boone's Park. And I growed up with these guys. And I placed them on the top of my list. And I wanted to be with them more than I wanted to be with my family. And I know that's not the way to be, but that's the way it was back then. And uh, I wanted to be down there at Shamrock, and I was there almost every day. And I loved to drink Fall City beer, and all the problems that went along with it was just part of my life. But I, I, the kids came, and, and I just got really uh, inside of myself, and I wanted to escape. And we just had a lot of problems and uh, Sheila decided that she would leave me, and she said it took her a long time to get rid of me because I would strike out with with anger. And uh, I came home one night. We lived out there in Oldham County, and Sheila had left and, and taken the family, and I went into an alcoholic rage, and I destroyed the whole house. I, I knocked every window that was in the house out, I cut the carpet off the floor and I knocked holes in the walls and turned the refrigerator over. And I remember doing every bit of it. And it made me feel good because I was getting back at her. Uh, as a result of that, uh, I sought out help and I don't know how I sought it out, but I ended up going and see a psychiatrist and, and went into Our Lady of Peace Hospital probably in 1971 or 72 and they didn't have an AA program or treatment program there. And uh, But I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was in there for 30 days, and, and I came out, and me and Sheila got back together, and, and I stayed dry for six months. I did not become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was around it, and after six months, I started to drink again, and I drank for another year and a half, and, and everything that you can think of basically happened. Uh, Sheila left me. Uh, by uh, Conan, because she couldn't tell me she was leaving me. And uh, I was living on a boat on the river, and she was staying with her mother or somebody. And I remember calling her one day from Shamrock after about three months. 
we hadn't found this farm farther out in the country. And I called her the telephone company and I asked her, I said, when are we going to find this farm? And she said, Ro, we're not going to get back together. She said, it's over between me and you. And I said, I was really angry, and, I, and I'm trying to think of what I'm going to do to her. And we had a little bit of money that we had put in the bank after the sale of the home. And so the only thing that I could think of was I told her, I said, look, I'm going to go get all of that money, and I'm going to take it and spend it. And she said, Ro, whatever money's left in there is yours, and I don't give a damn what you do with it. And she had already taken hers. <laughs> and that aggravated me. And uh, I went and checked, and she had taken too much. <laughs> and I called her up, and I told her about it. And she said, well, you know, we needed to do this in the family. And, and I didn't hear that. I just saw, I felt where I was at. And so I made her give me $1,640 uh, that she had cheated me out of. And, and she gave it to me, and I went to the bank and cashed a check and got all $100 bills, and I went down to Shamrock, and, and I, was, I was buying the drinks freely, you know. And it was a stag joint. And uh, somewhere in that afternoon, I, I, I was decided that I needed some female companionship. And we got a strip out there on 7th Street, and so I ended up out on 7th Street that night. And I, I found this gorgeous-looking lady out there. I mean, she, she, at least I think she was. <laughs> and, and I took her back to my boat on the river. And um, I woke up the next morning. I was half in my cabin and half out, and I didn't know what I had done the night before. And I, and I got up and, and I went out on the back of my boat and I tucked the water hose and I poured it over my head and kind of got me just a little bit straight and I brushed my teeth and I throwed up. And, and <laughs> I always blame brushing my teeth for me being sick, you know. And uh, I sat there in that lawn chair on the back of my boat and I had my breakfast was leftover white castles and big reds. <laughs> and I had a couple glasses or uh, bottles of Fall City beer and the fog lifted. And, and, and I realized uh, what I had done the night before. And I, I sold that cruiser probably about three or four years into sobriety. And, and I, I searched it one more time thinking I would find that $1,600 that I had the night before. <laughs> and I didn't. And, and so I got rolled that night for $1,600. And, and uh, I always say that if if you're here and you've got me on your amends list, I'd like to have my money back. <laughs> it ain't happened yet, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, I called my wife, naturally, to, to inform her that I had lost that money. I, I wanted her to, to share in my misery, and she hung up on me, and I uh, went, to, went to Shamrock. I couldn't get drunk that day. I, I tried getting drunk, and I, I couldn't get drunk. And at no time in that year and a half did I think about calling Alcoholics Anonymous again. In my heart, I wanted help. You know, when I was in jail and had been shot and beaten up and everything, and when I'm back in that little jail cell and, and all curled up, I was a little boy again inside. And I had that moment of truth. I know that I was in jail because of what I had done. And I could be honest with myself then, but I didn't know what to do with it. And when I was laying in bed mornings thinking that I wanted help, it never entered my mind to call Alcoholics Anonymous. But the thing that I've been able to do since I've been in AA is, is let that feeling come out that's been in there hollering and screaming, you know, hey, honesty, do the things you need to do. You know, me and Sheila had a, a really a, a, not a real good relationship, but I was out there and, and I want to tell you how I, I placed the values of the guys with my relationship 
we was pitching horseshoes and, and I embarrassed Sheila because I got drunk and fell in the horseshoe pit, I'm sure, you know, and, and she got embarrassed and walked in the house and, and I got up and the guys were standing there and, and I said, I go get her and, and bring her back out here and uh, as I went in the house, I, I just made the decision I'd go ahead and kill her, you know, because she had embarrassed me in front of my friends. And when I went into the kitchen, I was hollering and, and different things, and she said the other night that I broke, broke one of her plates or something. And, and But I grabbed her around the throat, and, and, and I started to kill her. And in self-defense, she took a butcher knife, and she ran that butcher knife halfway through me. And, and, and as I fell to the floor, I, 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 I was instantly struck sober. <laughs> I never got so sober in all my life. I mean, I, when, when, when I was there, I, I was sober. And, and uh, I was a little numb from the waist down. But I told her I was okay and just get a blanket and cover me up. And, and I know that what had happened was my fault. It wasn't hers. And I've not carried any anger or resentments about that, but I used it a lot throughout the years of my drinking. And, and so th this is what happened that day when I was down there at Shamrock. I, I, I cried out and I called a drop-in center, and, and the guy said that he could help me and wanted to know if I could go up on my boat and come out there and see him the next morning. And the prayers that I used to say as a little boy, would I ever get to be like my grandpa? He was kind and gentle, and he found the God of his understanding. And that's the only prayer I knowed back then. And so when I went up on my boat that, that afternoon or that night, and I don't know if I was sitting down or standing up or laying down, but I asked God to help me. And that's all I asked him. I said, God, help me. And God was good to me. I haven't had that desire to take a drink now for over 15 years, and I'm grateful for that. I've not had to fight that. But the thing that I'm aware of through reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous through our co-founders, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson, is that Dr. or Bill Wilson had that spiritual experience in the hospital, and that desire was lifted from him. And Dr. Bob went a couple years wanting to drink on a day-to-day -day basis, but didn't because he stayed close to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so everything that we are going through or have gone through or think we're going to go through, our answers is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the steps and the traditions. And, and, and so what I'm saying is regardless if it's lifted from you or not, you can stay sober on a day-to-day -day basis because it's already been done. It's in there for us if we'll pick up that book and we'll read it. And so when I surrendered that night, I went out to the drop-in center and I went into a treatment program that Monday. I didn't have anybody that I could call. And I called Sheila, and she hung up on me. And I was lonely and I was afraid. And I didn't know where I was headed. And I called her again. And she came and got me that night. And she took me to the drive-in. And the kids were there. And she came and got me Saturday. And she took my clothes Sunday and she washed them. And if, I, if it hadn't have been for her, I don't think I'd be here today. I thought she loved me. I said, she loves me. That's why she's doing it. But I learned after we came in the program that I was a human being and I was reaching out for help. And that's why she did it for me. And I'm grateful for that. A lot of miracles has happened in our life and I expect them to continue to happen. But I went through that treatment program and I became teachable. And the thing that they told me in there when I went in, I, I, they asked me to fill out a confidential application, and I couldn't spell the words, and, and I was embarrassed. And Hugh, the, the counselor, spelled the words for me, and he filled out the application. 
And I was admitted into that program, and they set me right in the middle of the room. And then they all read that their confidential application that I had filled out. And the old me wanted to run. And the new me said, Roll, stay. They care about you. They love you. But that fear was inside of me. And, and, and I didn't know I wanted to run, but I didn't. And it's the same way that it's been in Alcoholics Anonymous. I go into meetings, and the old me is still there, and I want to get off in the corner. And I don't want to, I'm afraid to go up and talk because that fear of rejection and different things. But my first sponsor told me, he said, go around and shake the hands of people and let them know who you are. And as a result of that, you'll feel better. And so that's what I try to do today. And I feel better for this. But I worked that program and I benefited from it a lot. And I learned that my dependency on my wife was the same that I had for my mother. And I started to grow, and that little boy started to grow inside of me. And, and it's been a, a struggle for me to allow that little boy to grow. And the lady told me in al one day, said, Bro, don't be so hard on that little boy and quit hitting him in the head and let him grow up. Be gentle with him and love him and care about him. And that's what I've allowed that little boy inside of me to do in the last 10 or 15 years is to grow up and become a man. And it's a good feeling. I guess about right now I'm 47, and that little boy inside me, he might be 20 today or 21. Some areas I don't think he's ever going to change, and that's okay. I like being a little boy, you know. And I'd be telling you a laugh. I tell you I don't like attention, you know. Walking around here with red and green socks on, you know. <laughs> It's good. But, you know, my life got too damn serious when I got sober. I, I quit reading the funny paper because there wasn't any death to it, you know. <laughs> I had lost my sense of humor, and, and I've got that back today, you know. And, and uh, I was separated from my wife, and, and uh, I had made a commitment to God that night that I would never forget where I came from and the help that I received. The goals that I've had for myself for the last 15 years have not changed one bit since that night. My goal for myself was that I wanted to be a better person to my fellow man. I wanted to be a better husband, and I wanted to be a better father. In order to get respect, I've learned that I've got to respect others. And that's what I try to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about being a father was, I didn't know if I would ever see my children again, if they would ever want to see me. But I know that I was willing to pay child support and that I was willing to do it freely and that that would give me the respect that I needed for myself, that I could walk around with my head up and irregardless if they wanted to be my children, I could still be their father. If I needed to pay Sheila alimony, I would have did that freely also. And But as a result of some things, I didn't need to do either one. My brother tucked me into his home after I came out of treatment, and I was separated from Sheila for about nine or ten months. And it was good for me because I was able to go to a lot of AA meetings. And I go to AA meetings every night probably in Al-Anon. I'm a very active member of Al-Anon for about 10 years. And I've had to tell Sheila that, you know, I've got to stay sober. And if I can't stay sober, I'm not any good to myself and I'm not any good to anybody else. And I don't know if she understands that or not. But that's just the way it is. And she's benefited a great deal. And I have. And my family has. Now, when we got back together, me and my family, I have three daughters. And at this time, they was like 14 and, and probably 9 and 3. And, and I wanted them back really bad. And when I got them back, I, I didn't know what the hell to do with them. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything right. You know, I, I'm working, I'm not drinking, I, I'm providing them a, a good home, and, and, and they ain't doing nothing right. And I'm telling them about it. 
And, and buddy, it was rough at my house, you know. And, and what I've learned is that I was looking through a big magnifying glass, and I could see everything that they was doing wrong, and I could see everything that I was doing right. And that's just the way it was. I'd go in the house at night time, left the meeting, and I would go in the back door, and, and I would look at the kitchen, and the kitchen was dirty. And I think I got a wife and three daughters, and they can't even keep the kitchen clean. <laughs> and so I would sit there, and I, and, and I would clean the kitchen, and I'd be madder than hell about it. And then I'd wake them up the next morning, and I'd march them down to the kitchen, and I would bang the table. And, and, and my oldest daughter is not in any program, and I'd tell them what I did. And my oldest daughter told me, she said, you know, Dad, that's just great that you cleaned the kitchen. She said, but the only reason you cleaned it is so you can tell us about it. <laughs> she said, did it ever enter your mind to clean the kitchen to help us and to set an example? And it hadn't. And I wanted to knock her right off that damn chair. <laughs> she aggravated me. <laughs> I gave a talk here about a month ago, and my oldest daughter went with me, and I told Dad, and I told her that uh, I, that they aggravated me, and, and my daughter came up after the meeting. She said, "Dad, next time you talk, I'd like to tell them people. I'd like you to tell them people that you pissed us off." <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, I still got that tunnel vision. You know, I, I just looking at at me, what what I what it is for me. None of them know how to put the toilet paper on the toilet roll. I used to have to take them in there and show them, <laughs> and they didn't learn nothing. You know, but you know, it only takes me about three seconds now to change that role, and, and my life ain't unmanageable no more about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sitting there having prayer and meditation every morning and wondering why I got to pick up all the toys throughout the house. And it, I, I'm mad about it, you know. And I tell them about it, and next morning I'm getting ready to go out the door, and there's a note on the door to Dad. And I read the note, and the note says, Dad, picking up toys after growing children is like shoveling snow when it's snowing. It's never ending. Not from her, and, I, and I've tried to take <laughs> what she said and put it to use, you know. So I, I do a lot of things today that I know is right, but I don't want to do them. But that's taking action. And as a result of it, I get good benefits back from it. And that's what I like. See, I'm not in this for nobody else but me. I like them good results. And, and, and that's how it is. But it's the action that I've got to take. You know, the uh, little rabbit was coming down the, the path. And, and, and as he was coming down through there, he heard this little boy's hollering, Help, help, help. And he looks over, and there's this little turtle in, in, in this big wagon rut of the road. What's wrong? He said, I, I'm stuck in this rut, and I can't get out. And he said, wait a minute, and I go get you some sticks and build you a little bridge, and you can get out. And the rabbit went to get it, and when he came back, the little turtle was gone. And the rabbit hollered out, turtle, turtle, where are you at? And the turtle hollered, I'm over here in the weeds. He said, well, how'd you get out of the rut? He said, I heard the wagon coming. <laughs> you can take some action, right? <laughs> I don't think there's anything that I've ever do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got to take the action. I can do all the praying I want to. I can do all the talking to people I want to talk to. But until I take some kind of action, there ain't nothing going to change. And, and I'm aware of that. And, and what, some of the things that motivates me is that I got tired of taking other people's actions. The end result is if I don't take action, then I turn my life and my will over to somebody else. And, and, and then they do whatever they want to do. You know, if I don't pay a bill, they come turn off my gas and lights. That's the bottom line. But if I make a call 
and tell them that I don't have the money to make that payment, then we can work it out some way. My life, I'm, I'm learning, is that I need to take action and I need to keep the focus on myself. My family loves me today, and I love them. Uh, my oldest daughter's 27, and uh, we've got a, a three-year-old granddaughter be three years old the 20th of this month, and me and my daughter have a good relationship today, and she cares about me. I've got a 22-year-old daughter named Karen, and Karen is just, uh, she's my sweetheart, I guess. She called us a lot of problems in our home. At 12 or 13 years old, she's doing drugs and smoking marijuana. She's climbing out the second story window. And dad's going crazy. I'm chasing after her. I'm in Al Anon at this time and I'm trying to do what I've learned in there. Cut them loose, love them, detachment. I'm powerless over them and different things and, and and for God's sakes, I learned it is if they do something wrong, let them take the consequences. And I thought, boy, if I ever catch her doing anything wrong, I ain't going to take off. She's going to take the consequences. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to enable her to continue to live in the way she's living. And I come by Eastern High School one day, and I look over there, and there's Karen and three or four other young teenagers there, and a police car. And I said, "Uh uh-huh. And so I just pulled up there real quick and jumped out of the car, and I said, lock her up. (laughs) He said, said, well, who in the hell are you? (laughs) And I said, I'm Ro Branham, her father. And he said, well, Miss Branham, she ain't did anything. (laughs) So I got back in the car and left. But but things was going, uh, it, it was a bad situation at, at our house. And, and so I took it, and uh, she was supposed to be home one night, and uh, by 10 o'clock or 9.30, because me and Sheila, I did work at the janitorial uh, at the European Health Spa as a, a, the janitor. I had that contract, and I had to go in there and do janitorial work every night. And I, I set out in my car waiting for her to come home, and she wasn't there when she was supposed to be. And we sat there, and the old me was angry. The new me was saying, hey, get up and leave, but I didn't. And so when she came up, Sheila said, it looks like she's staggering. And I drug her halfway across the front log into the living room, and I tucked my belt off, and I started to beat the hell out of her. And I had that moment of sanity. And I put my belt on, and I thank God that I hadn't hurt her. And as I walked out that door that night to go to the spa, I realized that she wasn't mine, that I was just her father, a person that was supposed to be responsible, and that she was a child of God. And I let loose of her and said, God, she's yours, and whatever happens is okay. Just guide me and Sheila and give us the strength we need to do what we need to do as parents. And we went through a lot of emotional pain with her. And I remember sitting in when we forced her into treatment, and I read a letter to her of how I had watched her as a young girl and how I had seen the change in her, the, the makeup and, and the earrings. And, and at 14 years old, she, she was 14 thinking she was 21. And I started to cry, and my lips came unglued, and then my jaw just came loose, and I couldn't go on talking. But I thank God right there that moment for giving me that opportunity to be a father and to be part of what I was doing right there. And I thank AA for that opportunity because I'm sober. And as a result, my daughter was forced into treatment And she stayed there and went through Minneapolis and was adopted into a family up there and came out and we moved and a lot of different things. And as of a couple months ago, Karen had seven years of sobriety. I've not talked about this. It really bothers me. I didn't think it did.
But she told me the other day that she didn't feel she was alcoholic and that she didn't have a problem. What I feel good about it is that I know that it's her choice. And that's what I was able to tell her. Honey, that's your choice. And you need to do what you need to do. I hope if you ever find out that you are alcoholic that you'll make it back to AA. And she told me, she said, I feel freer today than I've ever felt in my life. And I understand that because I'm an alcoholic. And I wanted to drink when I was a young person. And maybe she's not alcoholic. But a lot of her actions said she was. So maybe she'll make it back and maybe she won't. But I had to surrender and let loose of her again. And realize she's not mine. She's God's. And he'll take care of her. And whatever happens, we'll be able to deal with that. Mine and her relationship is not the same as it was then. And me and my wife has talked about it. But I could be at home, and, and we wouldn't say a whole lot to each other. But I could meet her at the Friday night family discussion meeting, and our eyes would shine. And we'd sit there and hug each other, and, and it, it was a different kind of love. Just like the love that we find up here. Don't matter where you came from or who you are, we love you and we care about you. And so I was able to cut her loose again the other day. I've got an 18-year-old daughter named Cynthia, and she's a freshman at the University of Kentucky. And she's been in al for three or four years, and I talked to her this morning. And she loves me, and she cares about me. And I'm proud of her. And she does a good job, and the young people are going to have a convention at the end of this month. And she's the al representative of the young people in that convention. And she's got the al speaker and the al speaker lined up, and she's going to introduce them. And she was at Simatonga here a year or so ago, and they asked her to come up, and she couldn't even say her name, and she started crying. So I'm going to be there. I, I want to be there and be part of her life because she's part of mine. Me and my wife, we have a good relationship today. I want to back up just a minute and tell you a, a little story about the spa. Uh, I, I cleaned that spa for seven years, seven days a week, because I needed a job. And I didn't want to do that janitorial work a lot of times. First couple of years, I was financially hurting. And I'd walk in there, and, and every night, I'm going to go down the tubes. And they got these glass mirrors everywhere. And man, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I'm a basket case. That fear of, of financially disaster, I, I didn't have any money. I, I just wanted to make it from month to month or week to week. And that went on for a couple years. And then one night I, I thought, well, hell, Ro, you ain't went down tubes yet. And so what I decided to do that I wouldn't believe a damn thing I thought negative after 9 o'clock. I'd let that shit just pass on through. <laughs> you know. And I use it today. You know. I, I don't make any major decision that's going to affect me, my family, or anybody else after 5 o'clock at night. You know. And I don't think, I don't grab a hold of them negative thoughts anymore after five o'clock at night. And people call me and they'll say, hey, it ain't nothing heavy. It ain't nothing heavy. <laughs> Cause they know they're gonna come up short, you know. But I'm back here and I'm sweeping the floor one night and I, you know, I'd like to have a father just sit down with every once in a while and, and just let him hug me. And tell me that he loves me. Even though I'm 47 years old and he can say, son, it's going to be okay. And I've not said the serenity prayer. I always say the Lord's Prayer when I feel like that. And I said, said the Lord's Prayer, our Father. And I stopped. And I thought, damn, I've had a father all along and I didn't really realize it. And I said, look, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and so I talk to my father and I try to listen. But I'm back in there, that spa about four years, and, and, and uh, I'm down on my hands and knees about one o'clock at night, and I'm cleaning this steam room, and I didn't want to be there. 
And I said, God, how long am I going to have to clean this damn spa? <laughs> the next thought I had was, well, if you're going to talk to him, then listen. And so I put the brush down. I leaned up against the wall, and I, and, and I just laid there, you know. And the first thought I had was, Moses and the Israelites lost in the desert for 40 years. And I said, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> <laughs> Forty years, man. <laughs> the bottom line was that um, <laughs> I could have did it a day at a time. And, and I cleaned that thing for another three years, and they closed the door, and, and I was glad to get the hell out of there. <laughs> I've been a painting contractor for the last five or six years, small painting contractor, and, and I do good work. I still make mistakes, and I've got people around me in AA and al that I do work for that love me and care about me because they don't let me slide. And I don't want nobody to cut any slack for me. If I'm doing work for you and I don't do the work right, I want you to tell me. And I really feel strong about this. If you love me, you, you won't let me slide. You'll tell me about it. And then let me just deal with it any way I want to deal with it, you know. But so many times throughout my life, people told me it's okay. You'll be okay. And I didn't learn anything. But when people that love me can take me over the side and say, "Hey, you supposed to did that and you didn't do it," then then I, I can I can go ahead and do what I need to do, and I grow from that. But my wife, I wanted to have a good relationship with her, and, and we've had a lot of problems, and we've cleaned the air, cleared the air a lot of times. We kindly made a deal with each other. She got tired. She every time I elevate my voice a little bit. She said I was hollering at her. Well, you know, you can't get into these emotional discussions without raising, at least I couldn't. And she always said I hollered at her and she always started crying. And it made me feel as bad to her crying as it did me hollering to her. And so I made a deal with that. I said, well, if you won't cry at me, I won't holler at you. <laughs> so that's what we tried to do today. But I'm not hollering as much and she's not crying as much. Because I've learned that it's an act and react disease. And, and if she acts one way and if I don't react, that's as far as it goes. And I've learned to do little things with my anger. I've surrendered and asked God to help me with it. And I haven't torn any doors off the wall and haven't wanted to choke Sheila to death lately. <laughs> Hopefully I never will. But uh, I've had to bring God into my life and ask Him to help me with my anger. And, and, and I don't, I still get angry. But you know, if I'm in a room and, and her actions are bothering me, and if I have any responsibility in her or if I don't have any responsibility in her, I used to think I used to have to sit in there and white knuckle it, you know, and, 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 and just listen and it was just churning inside of me. But I learned that if her actions is bothering me, I need to get out of the room where I can't see her. And then it just leaves. It ain't there. Or if I'm in a room and people are talking and their voices are bothering me, but what I hear, the only thing I need to do is get out of that room where I can't hear them, and I'm okay. And these are the little things that I've learned in the programs of what to do. And I've learned to keep the focus on myself. And I don't care what situations are going on outside of me. The bottom line is how I react to it. And I've learned that if I don't react in a negative way, then I'm a much better person and I can handle situations and I can work through problems. I know that things in my life far as love are not big things. I know today that it's the little things that we do. And the things that I've been able to do with my wife, I've tried to do the little things. I put the word courteous back in my vocabulary and I open up the car door for my wife and I let her get in and open up the car door when she gets out. And it's contagious, I tell you. My daughters, you know, they tell their husbands, you really are to watch dad, you know. And some 10 or 11, 12 years ago, I 
sitting there having meditation, and I thought about a school teacher telling me, if you haven't kissed your mother goodbye, you need to do it each morning because you might not get another opportunity. And so when I got out of bed that morning, I walked around and I gave Sheila a kiss on the cheek. And I told her I loved her. It was hard to do. Really hard. But I've been doing that now for over ten years. And, and, and it has joined us together. And we was down in Florida a couple of years ago, and, and after about three days, Sheila said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And she said, are you mad at me for any reason? I, I said, no, why? She said, well, you haven't been giving me that little kiss every morning. I said, hell, we're on vacation. <laughs> You know, you don't lose your sense of humor, folks, I'm telling you. You know, I'm still pretty quick on there. But my life is good today, and I'm a very active member of AA. I'm a believer in the big book and the steps, and I try to put it in my life every day. I have meditation every day, have had for the last 12 or 13 years, and they asked me to do that in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I put my spiritual growth before my material growth. And as a result of that, I've not went without my, all of my needs being met for the last 15 years. And I'd much rather be doing God's work than painting them houses. So, you know, I, I, I try to grow spiritually each day. And as I sit there each morning and have prayer and meditation, I ask God to slow me down and to go out and be a, a good service to others and to be a good worker. And I write down things that I'm grateful for. And I pray for the people that need help, and I pray for the people that I got resentments towards. And it's a prog it's a thing that you have to do, and then it becomes a habit. And then the thing that I've learned is, is that if you do the things you need to do when you're feeling good, you do them when you're feeling bad. But if you wait until that time, you won't do them very often. So as I sit there and I have that morning meditation and I ask God to come into my life, I know that I'm okay and that I'm going to be okay that day. I was out running this morning and the sun was coming up and it was 6 o'clock and I was so full. And, and the love that I felt inside of me and the love that I wanted to share with people was just overwhelming and I started to cry. And I'm so grateful that I got an opportunity to be sober. And the thing that I do each morning after that, I get down on my hands and knees, and I learned this little prayer, and it goes like this: God, I open up my heart and my arm. I open up my heart and my mind to you today, to use me as an instrument of your love, so that I can go out and share with someone what you've been so good to give to me. And it never fails throughout the day that when I'm in that frame of mind, that I don't get to share with someone and tell them what happened to me. Or that, hey, you're going to be okay and that I care and that I love you. And if you need me for anything, you call me and I'll be there. And I'm sincere about this. And my life is good today. And I, and I look forward to a lot of others. I'm going to close and I'd like to read just a little chapter out of the big book, A Vision for You. And it says here is that our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answer will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Omit your thoughts to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.